Being gifted with the ability to make others feel comfortable and encourage them to be the best that they can be led to Janice led Janice to her life's career as a social worker. Dr. Wesley Hogan is the director of the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University and research professor at the Franklin Humanities Institute and Department of History. She writes and teaches the history of youth social movements, human rights, documentary, and oral history. Dr. Adrian Litz Smith will lead this discussion. Um, as the moderator. Dr. Lynn Smith is Associate Professor and Associate Chair in Duke's Department of History, where she teaches courses on the Civil Rights Movement, Black Lives, Modern America, and History in Fact and Fiction. She serves on the Advisory Board for Duke University Press, as well as for the journals Modern America and Meridians, Feminism, Race, and Transnationalism. Before I pass it over to Ted, I would like to ask that everyone turn off their cameras and remain muted throughout the event so that the, so that the panelists can move to the top of your screen. Thank you so much, Ted, feel free. Asia, thank you so much. And thanks to Duke DC alumni, the DC chapter of Duke Black alumni, the Duke Women of Color of the greater DC and Baltimore areas, the Duke Archives and the Center for Documentary Studies, all of whom are co-sponsors of this event and to thanks to the organizers, Donica Black, Kimberly Page, Keisha Troy and Deja Wood and to Louise uh, Meyer and Mary Rupi Nash who are with Duke DC. And of course, thanks to Adrian Lynn Smith and Wesley Hogan and especially Bertie Howard and Janice Williams for participating in this discussion tonight. So as Deja mentioned, I first uh, looked at black student activism at Duke uh, when I was a graduate stu student and 23 years old. Uh, I did not end up finishing the master's thesis, which is the reason I was looking at the topic, but I uh, put the papers away in a box and they followed me for decades. And when I finished my 35 year career as a corporate lawyer, I decided it would be fun to revisit this, this work, this project, it would allow me to pursue my love of history and also further explore racial justice issues that had been important to me over my career. Since I only had a final chapter and the conclusion to write, I figured this project would take me at most a month or two. But with the help of a lot of people, including uh, history for Professor Bill Chafe, who was my supervisor and mentor then and again now, Duke archivist Valerie Gillespie and her team, Wesley Hogan, and Isla Fasado, my editor at Duke Press, what began as a small discrete project expanded over the next four and a half years to become point of reckoning. As you can imagine, this was a completely surreal experience for someone who had just finished a career closing business transactions. So putting aside how I came to write Point of Reckoning, there's a first question that I would be asking, were I in the audience tonight or were I someone beginning to read the book? And that is, is a white retired corporate lawyer living in Bethesda, Maryland, the right person to write a book about black, the black student movement at Duke and the fight for racial justice at Duke? Well, here's the answer to that question I would give. Um, You'll see if you read Point of Reckoning that it tells two stories. The first is about the Black student movement at Duke, and this part looks at why it was necessary and how it was even possible for a group of young Black undergraduates who came to Duke bearing the weight of enormous family and community pride and expectations to launch a movement to force Duke to confront its Jim Crow past and present even when protest men putting their physical safety, not to mention their futures and their uh, career prospects on the line. But the second story is the story of how white men who ran Duke in the 60s stifled racial change, even in the face of determined black, pro uh, black protest. And I'll start with this piece of the story first. So the story of the failure of Duke's leaders to uh, respond to, to black protest is due ultimately to the leaders' failures of empathy, failures of self-reflection and uh, failure of moral commitment to racial justice that allowed or caused racial change at Duke to be largely static through the 60s. 
Of course, the, uh, the failures described in Point of Reckoning are not in any way unique to Duke or to historically white colleges and universities. They are present at other historically white institutions, including corporate law firms. So as I look back over my work on Point of Reckoning, I think the decades I spent working in big law firms gave me insights into the tropes, the patterns, the habits, the attitudes that manifest to stifle racial change. Uh, Wesley once pointed out to me that there are not a lot of civil rights books written by retired corporate lawyers. So it could be that I'm better situated than most by virtue of my law firm experience to understand and describe this part of the story. As to the black student movement at Duke, am I the right person to write that part of the story? Well, the answer is probably not. Uh, while I'm proud of Point of Reckoning and the story it tells, there's no way that someone of my background can fully understand the historical family, community, racial or historical context in which these black undergraduates were operating. I tried to approach this part of the story with humility, I committed to telling the story in the words of the participants and not in my words. I kept my voice in the background. And I also relied on diverse peer reviewers and readers and others to comment. That said, I think if I were starting work on Point of Reckoning today with the insights I now have, I would seek a Black co-author or collaborator for research and writing of the book. I think the book would be a stronger book as a result. So just to frame the book uh, briefly, um, we all know that until uh, the fall of 1962 when graduate students arrived and the fall of 1963 when uh, black undergraduates arrived, Duke was a segregated institution. Uh, to put a finer point on it, this meant that Duke was a school endowed, designed and operated by white people for the exclusive benefit of an all white student body, faculty and administration. Every course that was taught, every school tradition that was established, all of the food served in the dining hall, the plays shown in Page Auditorium, uh, social events, uh, design choices, the student body, the faculty, these were all chosen by white people for white people. The vast majority of black people on the Duke campus were uh, service workers who were paid barely, barely subsistence wages. And because of segregation in Jim Crow, the whites who ran Duke, at least the, major the vast majority of them, likely knew few, if any, black people other than those who interacted with them in a service capacity at work or at home or, or, or perhaps at the country club. At least theoretically, this could have changed in the fall of 1963 when black undergraduate students first began to arrive at Duke. They were the best and the brightest in their communities, each had stellar records of achievement, strong academics, strong extracurriculars, community service. The provost told the board in these early years that these students could have been admitted anywhere in the country. So how did Duke respond to the arrival of these students and what changes did it make? Well, although Duke had lofty aims, uh, the union of knowledge and religion, a spirit of tolerance, a dedication to service, its leaders did almost nothing to prepare for the arrival of black undergraduates. Once desegregation occurred and with very few exceptions, Duke's leaders did not monitor how the new black students were faring did not seek to develop personal relationships with them, and never considered the possibility that changes would be required to an all white institution to accommodate the distinctive cultural, academic, and social needs of its new black students. Uh, William Griffith, Dean William Griffith, who, who many of us uh, know from our time at Duke told me in 79, there was a general feeling that the black students would go right into the student body. It was expected, according to Griffith, that the Black students would take their place as members of the Duke community through a natural kind of amalgamation. We looked at segregation from a white perspective, he explained to me. So Brenda Armstrong, uh, who arrived at Duke in, in the middle of the 60s, remembered the transition from the predominantly Black atmosphere of her childhood to Duke Sea of White as overwhelming. Bill Turner, um, who was for many, many decades a, a beloved professor in the Divinity School, 
required going from the all black setting of his pre-college years to the an complete antithesis at Duke as almost as complete a shock as you can encounter. And most black students encountered racism routinely. Racist comments and discriminatory grading practices by professors, deans that communicated that students were not smart enough for careers like medicine, incidents of harassment by police, sporting events where uh, the Confederate flag was displayed and where the crowd stood en masse to sing Dixie, sororities and fraternities that were off limits, uh, racial epithets, physical threats, on and on. And there were Jim Crow university policies that remain, remained in place even after desegregation. Duke was not ready to have black students here. Uh, Afro-American society leader Chuck Hopkins told me again in 79, they didn't realize that integration meant they had to make some changes too. According to Hopkins, the administration's view was that bringing us to Duke was like bringing the natives into civilization. Brenda Brown, who is now Brenda Brown Becton, uh, saw the administration's stance to the black students as shut up, don't make waves and get out. You're here because we need some black spots on campus to make things look right. Other than that, we don't wanna hear from you. So this is the thread and really one of the main threads that runs through Point of Reckoning. White administrators and faculty made essentially no attempt to understand the lived experience of Duke's black students. They did not try in the vast majority of instances to learn about the families, communities, schools, churches, or history that had produced these remarkable kids and what distinctive needs they might have. But this did not prevent these leaders from holding and acting upon strong opinions about who these students were, what they wanted, what they needed, whether Duke should make changes, and ultimately even why they were protesting. But these opinions uh, were grounded in racial myths and not facts. So this is the dynamic, the failure of the relationship between Duke and its black students that sets the story in point of reckoning in motion and provides the backdrop for the emergence of the black student movement at Duke that we'll discuss tonight. And with that, I'll throw it back to uh, Adrian and um, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, we are going to have plenty of material for a rich conversation. Before we launch on that conversation, I wanna remind y'all the audience of a few things. We're gonna talk for about half an hour and then we are going to open it up for your questions. I encourage you to put your questions in the chat box, which is kind of down there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and you can do that as those questions occur to you during, the, during, our, during our discussion. And we'll try to get to as many of them as we can between 7.45 when we start that part and 8.15 when we end. Um, you know, I think we all understand that Duke has um, work yet to be done um, as evidenced by the Living While Black event as articulated by President Price this summer as discussed in the Indy, the local um, alternative weekly just, just today. Um, but I am a historian. And what I always say to my students who increasingly are joint history and public policy majors is that you need to understand what happened before you go charging off, um, determining what to do about it. You wouldn't walk into a living room with a broken lamp and not look around to see if like there's an elephant or an active dog in the room, don't fix the lamp if you don't know if the problem is still there. Um, so what I'm going to ask of y'all today or for this next hour or so is that we spend this time talking about um, the past and reckoning with the past um, that laid the groundwork or produced the present that we live in. And with that in mind, we are going to talk about Duke's racial history in this discussion, not its racial present which means that we're not going to speak about recent events, including um, that letter to the editor that was in the Duke Alumni Magazine and the very eloquent response that followed from Duke Black Alumni. This is completely an important issue and it should be discussed. 
Um, but there will be time for that actually immediately following. This event ends at 8.15 and at 8.30, there is a kind of post-game discussion led by Deja that will go on for another 45 minutes. And so maybe what we can do in this time a little bit is to provide the material that makes that later conversation even more informed. All right, and with that, I am going to turn to the questions. My first one is for you, Ted, and it kind of picks up on where you, where you began your remarks. I think it's a remarkable thing to start a project in 1979 and return to it kind of the same, but with the passage of time, as different a person as the passage of time makes you. Um, writers like readers bring something new to a piece of writing every time they revisit it. So I'm wondering how the intervening decades changed what you brought to this project, um, the kinds of questions that you had, um, and the sorts of things you were able to hear in your research or wanted to talk about in your writing. That's a wonderful question. So when I was 23 and interviewing Bertie and Bill Turner and Brenda Armstrong and Chuck Hopkins, they were approaching 30. And as a 23 year old, I saw them as fully formed grownups and the fact that they had participated in the Allen Building takeover turned them into what I describe as two dimensional black activist action heroes in my head. When I returned to the work 40 years later, I had been the parent of college aged children and had the experience of drop, dropping my own kids off at college. And if you've had this experience, you know that 18, these children are young. Uh, Janice uh, uh, Williams in an interview describes them as adolescents. And, and I knew the anxieties that I felt as a parent just dropping my kids off at school. And I could imagine the anxieties that the black students' parents must have felt uh, as they left campus, having dropped their kids off to school. So that uh, realization, which came actually like a lightning bolt early on, uh, really transformed how I thought about the story, how I wrote about the story when I re-interviewed uh, a number of the activists in 2018, I began to ask them about their families and their parents and the schools they went to and the communities they were from. I was able to take a far more human view uh, of these, of these uh, amazing youngsters who I had previously just looked at as abstractions. And then the second thing, just real quick, is that because 50 years had passed since the events that I was writing about, all of the Duke archival records were fully available, um, subject to confidentiality. And in this period, uh, segregation was so per pervasive, it inspired little reflection. And so in these letters and in alumni letters and in correspondence, people spoke of their racial attitudes uh, very directly, and they didn't hesitate to lay out what uh, today we would certainly see as, as racist uh, tropes. Um, and the experience of sitting hour after hour after hour after hour in the archives reviewing these letters helped me understand in a way I didn't when I was 23, the depth of attachment to these ideas and um, how pervasive they are. Um, and, and again, the same themes kept coming up again and again. I write them up, about them in my book. So uh, I, was, I was better able to sort of understand part of the story by virtue of um, you know, the access to records and the realization it allowed me to have. So that's, that's kind of how I would answer that question. Yeah, I didn't realize how grown I was not as an undergraduate until I became a college <laughs> professor. Right. Um, so Bertie and Janice, I would ask a similarly themed kind of question of y'all. I'm curious about your experiences um, 
as an undergraduate from the experience in protest, but your experience with other students, with students who didn't think of themselves actively as investing in protest. Um, I'm interested in your relationships with family members who may not have, may or may not have understood or supported your choices and those that did. But then I, after y'all talk about that, I'm also curious about if you've revisited those memories or if you think about your Duke experience differently at different moments in your life or at different moments in, in the nation or the world's life. Um, let me throw a real bomb in here. <laughs> uh, one of the things is, I don't know how many people on um, the discussion know that two years ago, there was a magnificent 50th anniversary commemory of the take Allen Building takeover. And part of the, one of the most important parts to me were the, not the public events, but the quiet times with folks you hadn't seen in 50 years or 30 years or 10 years or whatever. And the one piece, and as I thought right now, that's missing in the book is, Ted, you assume we all wanted to be at Duke and very few of us wanted to. Um, when I was in high school, I was a serious nerd and me and my friends all applied to an Ivy League school, a big name white Southern school, and then the school we really wanted to go to. And for me, that was Howard University. And this was before yeah. Kamala yeah. Harris was there. <laughs> um, but that was my school. And part of that discussion two years ago was that none of us thought we'd be at Duke at the end of our freshman year. We all were going, and, and people named, this is where I would be. And at one point, um, Becton said to me, because Becton is um, a Howard grad, and I, over the years, over the decades, we've talked about that. And he said, so now do you wish you had been in school with me? And I said, definitively, yes. And the issue for me was not so much the serious racism at Duke, but it just wasn't me. Um, and I missed, I, I, one of the things I really remember, I was one of the people who went to, towards a black university. And the whole weekend people said, you try to make Duke into a black university. <laughs> but the issue was all of the things that you really just could not participate in. Um, you know, fun things, learning things, community things. And so, you know, we all kind of sucked it up. And for me, at the end of my freshman year, I did say to my parents, okay, now I want to go to Howard. And my dad said, no, you said you wanted to go to Duke. But again, the issue for me was I was also in that first class of National Achievement Scholars. And they did not award the scholarship to me. They awarded it to Duke. And the I, when I think back on there, I put Duke as my first choice school because I thought it would help me get the scholarship. And obviously that impressed them, but it also meant that's where I ended up for four years. But if you ask me now, would I do it again? I don't think so. Understood. Janice? Okay. Uh, I was enjoying that. I forgot I was supposed to be talking <laughs> next. Okay. Um, my experiences at Duke, um, what I remember is always seeking out other Black students. Uh, it brought me comfort to be at the table in the union. It brought me comfort to be in other dorm rooms with other Black uh, uh, students, I could find them. Um, Lynette Lewis Austin was in my freshman dorm and I had a white roommate who didn't want to be at Duke, let alone be there with me. And um, she actually was in the first class of women admitted to Yale. Her dad had gone to Yale, her brothers had gone to Yale and that's what I heard all the time. She was very unhappy. Uh, so another reason why I did not want to necessarily spend time in my room. But I also remember uh, all of the people who wore that Duke blue, who took care of us. And uh, 
without them, I don't think I would have been able to uh, settle down and put one foot in front of the other each and every day uh, without the other students. And many of them, uh, we weren't real spread out like uh, many of the black students are today that are admitted. Uh, we were mostly from the Southeast and the, you know, we met people's families and that was a treasure uh, for me as well. Uh, I was able, it was too expensive for me to go back to Huntsville, Alabama over a short holiday, Thanksgiving. So I actually went to Smithfield with uh, Regina Sanders, who uh, was another Duke student in my class. Now, um, I think that they weren't ready for us and, and that many administration, uh, faculty wasn't ready and they could not imagine what our needs were. Uh, my class only had um, uh, 43 Blacks admitted. And you talked about it, Ted, in the book, that by the end of my, the first semester, my freshman year, I am 68, 69, was, so I was a freshman <laughs> with Alabama, uh, Allen, Allen Bilden takeover. And um, the half of the guys were gone. There were 13 females and 30 males admitted, black males. And we were down to 15 black males by the end of the first semester. So you go home, you know, Christmas back then, the break was around that. You come back and you're like, where are all these people? Uh, so it was just uh, it really disheartening. And um, I had to learn to stick it out uh, and I, one of the reasons I was thinking about here, one of the reasons I think I sought out black people is, Bertie, you're frowning. Are you frowning because of something I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, was in no, high school. No, thank you. Okay, think on. In high school, I was in the first class of blacks to integrate high school. Remember George Wallace was the governor and it was my 10th grade year, which is where high school started in uh, Alabama. And I was one of 10 blacks in a school of 2000, the very first uh, of that group. And what helped me get through that over the next three years is I could go back home to my black community and my, you know, I was just there during the day, not residential. And I could go, I could look, you know, at them. But when I would be at school and go to the bathroom and look in the mirror, I was like, that's not how everybody else is looking because all I saw was white people. I did not see another black person until lunchtime. There were 10 of us, there were three lunch periods and they had divided us evenly. Um, and it was strange when I think back on it. So now when I think back on stuff like that, we didn't even have a black janitor. There were no black cooks. There were, I mean, when I say white, I meant white. And um, so there were things we had to do. And I've, I've come to understand that, um, that, that I did what was needed. And I'm glad that I wasn't necessarily very conscious of it, but conscious enough to be able to uh, take care of myself. We uh, did a number of protests. And uh, I did think we were part of a movement because James Brown was singing, I'm black and I'm proud. And <laughs> Angela Davis was, you know, preaching and uh, Stokely Carmichael came and, you know, we, we had Dick Gregory. So yes, I did think <laughs> I was part of a movement, but also not sure how do I be part of a movement and leave campus? You, you know what I mean? I, I'm not getting ready to venture off to another state. And um, I really don't remember anybody, uh, Dr. Lent Smith, I don't remember anyone who did not support our actions, who did not have the same, meaning my family and my friends, uh, who did not uh, say to us, you need to be careful though, uh, you know, uh, watch out that you aren't subject to violence or victim to violence. Uh, and I think that any fellow students 
uh, such as the roommate I talked about, who may not have been in support, uh, would not dare at that time, because by then, thanks to Bertie and Cat LeBlanc, I had a big old Afro, I wore big glasses, and uh, the, you know, we joke about we all look alike. And there were a couple of times people would walk up to me and ask me if I was Angela Davis. So, <laughs> uh, but the, the I, I, they wouldn't dare say anything. So I'm not aware of it. I did experience in my high school, but I did not experience uh, directly in my face uh, at at Duke. Uh, just meaning just my people, you know. So I'm going to stop. I mean, so you're, both of y'all's remarks, I mean, this is just a little touch on closer to now, remind me of how confused and intrigued I was at first when I realized that so many of my students really loved a different world, the sitcom that was the spinoff of The Cosby Show, until I realized that the appeal of that show for them was Hillman College and an experience uh, like sort of a vicarious experience of seeing the kind of like, you know, adolescent struggles, but not in the context of like struggling against ambient, you know, racial, if not hostility, at least difficulty. Um, it also reminds me of this, both of your stories that my father who is um, close to y'all in age, but chose not to integrate when he, when the school came to him to be exemplary, part of the exemplary class to go to the white high school in Monroe or West Monroe, Louisiana. And he was basically like, no. And when I asked him about it, his response was, you need to understand Adrian, at Richardson, I could do anything I wanted. At the white high school, I would have done whatever I was allowed to do. So for him, that was very much a, a choice about self-preservation. Um, which I thought was a, you know, when I was young, you know, again, the question of how do you change over time? When I was young, I was indignant with him for not being, you know, more courageous or, you know, more pathbreaking. At this point, looking back, I'm like, that was on some level, a really, like, it, it required a level of self-knowing that I appreciate in retrospect. Um, Wesley, can I ask where you? Where are you from? Yeah. Where where did your father go to school? What state? Louisiana, Northern Louisiana. So my parents um, are from Monroe and West Monroe, and then they ended up at Southern. Um, also with Dick Gregory coming through campus and, and that sort of thing. Um, Wes, can I ask you two questions in one? One kind of, you know, I just linked it, my, my thoughts just linked it a little bit to my parents and their moment of desegregation or not and choosing an HBCU. But as Bertie was talking, I was also thinking a little bit about, is it that episode of Eyes on the Prize where Paula Giddings and folks are talking about student, like, you know, actually this kind of like black student movement challenging their faculty at, at Howard. But, you know, is this story, is Ted's story a specifically Duke story? Is it a story of a moment? Is it a story? I mean, will you place us a little bit in, in, in time and context. Yeah, I would love to, but on the condition that I have so much respect for you as a colleague that I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question and then I'm going to ask you to talk back to it. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's great to be with everybody tonight and I'm really honored to be, um, both with Miss Williams and Miss Howard. Um, so I think first and foremost, this is a response to two generations represented by the Board of Trustee Chair Tisdale and President Knight, who had held on to antiquated notions of power, a kind of power over others, instead of building power as community building. And so it's not unlike uh, the chancellor at Berkeley and how he responded to the free speech movement in 1964, or how Harvard's president and board of trustees responded to the student movement there, particularly the anti-war movement. Um, these are white male leaders over 40 um, at Duke, but elsewhere with an enormous sense of entitlement. And they're challenged by a situation that they didn't understand. Um, in Berkeley in 64, at Harvard in 67, and at Duke, 
when black students ask simply to be treated with equal dignity. And young people suffer then as they suffer now from something a young person I met and interviewed in 2015. Uh, this is a young woman in Berkeley named Nona Perry and she called it adultism. And, and when I asked her more about it, she I learned this from her. It's this sort of formidable condescension of most adults who tend to minimize or dismiss the good ideas of young people simply because they're young. And, and so I'm gonna sidebar this for just a second to, to, to I think this is a part of, of the answer to your question, Adrian. So when, when the rules that young people are expected to follow in really any generation reveal foul realities as Ted laid out in his opening remarks, you know, when these young, really talented um, students come to Duke and show up at Duke and they're like, oh my God, like what is, what is going on? And people in positions of authority are no longer willing or able to question those foul realities or even see them. Um, these young black people on campus simply stood up and time and again, their actions uh, on behalf of their own dignity unmasked the adults who had, who had power or who had been accommodating power and had kind of resigned themselves to those noxious but familiar realities and who had rationalized a wide swath of crimes against logic and decency as somehow inevitable. What else can we do? Um, so Tisdale and Knight had, had asked like, what else can we do? This is the way it is. You know, we don't, we don't collectively bargain. We are not in support of these policies. We, we don't have enough money. And then the young people acted in new ways that answered the question, <laughs> here is what you can do. Um, and so Duke's young black people then were part of a much broader black revolutionary generation. And this was so important because they came to these noxious realities and were not resigned to these everyday pathologies of campus life. And of course, young people do this all the time. Um, we saw this when a young child asked his grandmother in the 1950s, why can't I use this water fountain? Or when an 11 year old asked in New York City of his parent, you know, in the 1980s, why did the police stop and frisk me and then curse me out on the way to school? Uh, we hear it when Dakota Iron Eyes at 13 years old at Standing Rock in 2016 said, doesn't everybody and everything need water to live? And, you know, we listened to it, all of us across the country in 2018 as a six year old was torn apart from her parents uh, at the border and, and cried no and why. So they're all the right questions. All those questions that the three-year-old at the water fountain asked and the young people at Duke asked and the 13-year-old at Stadium Rock asked, but at key junctures in the nation's history, it appears very hard for the adults in the room to recognize right because they're blinded as they routinely are, as we routinely are um, by the false realities of adultism kind of posing as wisdom, or in many cases as naked power, posing as maturity. So <clears throat> just rolling back to Adrian, your excellent question, Duke's Black students were a part of a much larger global movement of youth led by Black youth, Brown youth, and Indigenous youth who were encountering this older generation of a very entitled white men who had rigidly held onto power. <clears throat> and they were trying to assert a fresh political vision of equality. And so they used all kinds of different tactics. At Duke, they used nonviolent direct action, they used boycotts and all other manner of tactics, which Ted lays out to pave the way for the Duke that we're imagining forward today where everyone can thrive. And I just am really grateful to be here on the panel tonight. I um, wanna thank and honor Mrs. How Ms. Howard and Ms. Williams um, for paving that way for all of us. Um, but Adrian, I also want to turn it back to you and, and encourage you with your brilliance and wisdom. Can you share with us how you would answer that question? I, want to hear it. <laughs> I could do the classic thing that the person does right after the person who's answered it really well. And I could say, I think you did such a, I, my answer is the same as Wesley's. I want to take what Wesley said and restate it in other words. No, um, how would I, I would link it to this moment that, you know, folks have been writing about of, I mean, what Martha Biondi, I think I, you know, it 
Ted quotes or quotes her in the book, but this moment, the black revolution on campus. And that book is about not just HBCUs, it's about all kinds of campuses and the ways in which students um, find a politics that's about demanding not just access, but institutional transformation and how learning to do that on the campus space then outfits them and it's kind of sends people on trajectories that they might not have been on otherwise, right? Um, you know, I think there is, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting way to talk about black power with more nuance than our kind of, you know, not where historians necessarily are, but where the popular conversations about black power and the sort of like, you know, the kind of fascinating fascination with a sort of basic attest, a, aesthetics and kind of like manly militancy, right? Like we kind of forget all of the ways in which black power manifested and all of the fruit that it bore. Um, and so I see the book as doing that. And then, I mean, and maybe this is after 14 years of, of being at Duke or 13 and a half, I think the story of a uh, institution that on some level, like the institutional story, the administrators, the, the preserving an idea of Duke or the comfort Duke as an abstraction that has no meaning as opposed to the community of learners and scholars that it was supposed to be, right? Sort of preserving the idea the Duke, the dukiness of Duke at the expense of the scholarly community is a really, I mean, it's in some ways agonizing to watch unfold and, on, and perhaps instructive and telling. And in the same way that you begin by being like, look at Berkeley with free speech, look at Harvard with anti-war. It is the specifics, the way the story unfolds in this particular place is Duke's story. But this seems to me a story of many universities in this moment and many kinds of institutions in that moment and after, right? And into ours, which um, we have gone, I'm trying to be mindful of the time in the Q and A, we've gone over our time. I was going to ask this final um, question. I think I will, if anybody wants to, to tackle it, um, but then we should all tackle it very succinctly so that the many folks who are here with us have their chance. But it's sort of like, what did these points of reckoning, the silent vigil, the Allen building takeover, the other articulations and challenges that sort of came with all of that, what did they accomplish? What did Duke learn from this period? Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's a question for the after discussion, I don't know, but we can, we can think about it. And then, um, and what did we learn from, for some of us reading, for one of us writing, this book, or also from reading your own writings. I find that sometimes you write a thing and then you have a different relationship to it as a reader. You know, I wondered, I don't know that we've ever had this conversation, Janice, but do remember that we did not graduate from Duke University. We graduated from women's college. And there was also the engineering school and the nursing school. There were different admission standards. Um, and one of the things that I truly remember is that there were white female activists because during that time, again, you know, the rules and regulations they had for women were truly archaic. And Mary Earl was a president of the Women's Student Government Association. She was very, again, a, an activist and really into women's issues. And then, you know, two years later, there was the Vietnam War and then um, you know, so there was just a lot of activism going on. And I suspect that in the smaller confines of us being on East Campus, that it was easier. There was a question from someone about people being nice. It's not the nice, it's just that I think there are a lot of things we had in common that we could work on together. I, I shouldn't say that, that doesn't mean they were not nice people. I, I think that it was a lot easier to live on East Campus than it was, I think. I know that it was a lot easier to live on East Campus than it was to live on West Campus. I saw that same question. 
And I would like to say that uh, I did find, I was surprised at a couple of people who were kind to me, uh, white people who were kind to me, they tended to be the females though. I don't remember uh, one white male. Um, and to quickly answer the question, uh, and I, I, I apologize if I offend you, uh, I think what Duke learned is that they needed to make different decisions in who would they bring to the campus. Uh, we're not going to bring uh, too many more of those southeastern uh, hail raisers. We're going to make sure we bring in students from uh, more metropolitan areas who are used to us because they're not used to white people. We thought they would be, but they're not. So I think that they it, it just made them look for a different way to be racist where it wouldn't be as obvious that they were being racist, if you know what I mean. So like I said, I do apologize if I'm offending, but that's my short. I mean, Adrian, one thing that's notable in terms of the question is the progression of presidents at Duke. I mean, Douglas Knight was this Northern uh, quote unquote progressive who said the right things, but was utterly unwilling to invest any political capital in, in racial change. Um, when he was, was run out of Duke uh, after the Allen Building takeover, he was succeeded by Terry Sanford, who did have a moral commitment to racial justice. And so although these um, patterns repeat and repeat and repeat. And part of what's so compelling about looking at them at the first is they're just crystal clear. Um, although these patterns repeat under different leaders, more or less progress on some of these issues, I think it's fair to say ha have been made. It does seem like the um, contrast between night and what we know of Terry Sanford tells you that like, you know, I I I often go back to like everything is structure, 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 structure. We really need to think about like what has built this. And yet like structure is made or unmade with through actions and people have to choose to make those actions or to not, right? Like night is a study in a repeated choice not to do things. And so like who's in place matters. Right. And it's not, I mean, I could have had many critiques of kind of representational politics, but you put the right people in the right places and all of a sudden you can have different structures if everyone can 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 work to make that happen. I'm going to turn to some of the questions. So y'all have been doing a nice job of hitting the questions in your discussions. Um, but I want to add this one, which is aimed um, directed to Janice specifically, which says Janice. You're also a Duke parent. Did you discuss your Duke experiences with your son during his college application processes? If so, what were those conversations like? And were you surprised that he chose Duke? Uh, let me start from the last one. Very surprised he chose Duke uh, because teenagers don't tend to follow their parents, right? And uh, I actually married someone who went to Duke. So uh, he had uh, both parents were Duke alum. And um, he told me he was talked into it by his fellow students at the North Carolina School of Science and Math, that they told him that if they had a chance to go to Duke and have a scholarship, that they would not miss that. But I did share with him our experiences. He knows how I felt uh, about it. And how difficult it was. And he didn't agree with me uh, of, um, about my views of racism and uh, how difficult it might be until he got there. And at the end of his freshman year, we had a much better talk <laughs> about his experiences. I hope I answered that. Yeah. Um, do any of the rest of you have Duke children and how have they talked about have they had conversations about race and their and 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 their experiences or questions about yours? I, I, I think we're going to go another way, Janice. Okay, so, uh, Janice and I are aces of all aces. We have been together consistently for the last fifty years. Her children are my children, and 
I thought you were going to play the Brenda card. <laughs> um, because Brenda Armstrong, while she fought Duke tooth and nail, truly loved Duke. And I think she was really hardcore. That's where Torraine needed to be. But I think some of the others of us fell in line. I mean, I had conversations with him. You know, you got to do this, that, and the other, and blah, blah, blah. And I know what you wanted, you know, what your career path is. I mean, Duke can be very, a very powerful place to say you can get ahead in the world. And that's what we want for our children. And that's what we want for our young people. And the other thing is, and we're going to be right here close to you to make sure folks don't take advantage of you and that kind of thing. But um, I think the other thing that's really important for people to understand is that the Black students who were at Duke in those formative, like the formative years, we are still very close. And we still check in with each other every now and then. And there are groups for whom, I mean, we email everybody every day, five, six times. I mean, you know, so we have some very close, I mean, I call those folks my family. I mean, we are good friends, but more than that, we are family. I mean, you know, for many years, we went to the beach together. We took trips together. We were just, you know, Janice's crew, their children grew up together in the summers. They went to summer camp together. They had experiences together. I mean, so we got this Duke crew. <laughs> I, 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 let me stop because you all the other things we need to talk about. But <laughs> just want to point out that we do have classmates who are parents, uh, Duke parents as well. So uh, all of us didn't succeed in talking them out of it. Um, will y'all talk a little bit? I mean, so this question asks, what role did the, the vigil in 68 and the student support for the black non-academic employees union, which led to the exit of Tisdale and Knight have on Duke and the direction of the university? Um, my sense was that it was a turning point for Duke, but I'd also fold into that uh, a request for Ted to talk a little bit more about, or all of any of y'all to talk about the relationship between student activism around their conditions and student activism around labor conditions. Cause I think that that is actually, or kind of labor's ability to organize. Cause that seemed to me an important thing in the book that someone coming to it from the outside might not have known to look for or to anticipate. Well, one thing that's uh, uh, noteworthy is that uh, uh, with the activism at Duke, especially in the context of the vigil, the vigil was consciously set apart from the anti-war movement. There's a famous story that Joan Baez and David Harris came to the vigil they had previously been scheduled and tried to draw connections between the vigil and the anti-war movement and they were basically shouted down. Um, I think that uh, uh, the, I mean, the, the protests that occurred at Duke uh, were focused to a great degree on the non-academic employees. And that's because I think the, and Jan, uh, Ms. Williams and Ms. Howard can clarify this, but, but there was a very close connection, just a very close personal connection between the black students in the period and the, uh, the Duke service workers, uh, just, just familiarity and connectivity. So there was a lot of uh, closeness there. And um, I think there was almost seen as some overlap between student protest and protest on behalf of the workers. So, um, oh. I'm sorry, were you, were you about to say something? Wait, I can't hear you. <laughs> uh, one of the things back in the uh, late 60s was that in local parentis that do for women's college that, you know, there was always that discussion of, you know, we're responsible for y'all because y'all are women and we're your parents. Um, and <laughs> that whole, a whole nother four hour conversation. But, but, but the thing is the non-academic workers on East campus looked out for us. 
they made us go to church with them. <laughs> they invited us to little socials. Um, you know, you're not gonna earn that blouse before you go to class, kind of thing. <laughs> yes, uh, fried chicken. Yes, I mean, it was not just being nice to each other. They really were our parents in absence. And I do remember that um, when the first strike occurred, I had a conversation with several women. Did you see <laughs> Miss Brandon out there on the picket line? And when she saw us, she just stood up stronger, got a big grin on our face, and we started clapping for her. And so it was also for them, I think, for a lot of them, an affirmation that we are doing the right thing. And, you know, I, maybe folks in my community might think, oh, you're going to lose your job or my family or my children I might not do. But these are smart students right here. And they're like, right on. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So um, this question says, the way I read your section about the vigil, Ted, and then the interim period before Allen building, it appears that the AAS did not really want to join the vigil and did not respond to Jack Sell's request for comment on his proposal for a blended uh, funded Black Studies effort. Did I read this correctly? In your research, is there a clear understanding of why? Well, those are two separate uh, uh, episodes. So in the case of the vigil, I think it's, widely acknowledged that while there were exceptions, the vigil, which occurred in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King, was it was a predominantly white event. It was a white visual, vigil. That's what Charles Becton told me when I, when I interviewed him. And I think that part of the vigil was to kind of demonstrate to the Black community in a way that you know, Brenda Armstrong described to me as patronizing that, you know, nonviolent protests could still work. Well, at least in my book, the Afro-American Society had been started by then. And while it took no position on whether uh, an individual could support the vigil, the Afro-American Society stayed out of it because it, again, it was viewed as a, as a, as a white protest and not something that the black students uh, were behind the the period of between uh, uh, the fall of of sixty eight until the Allen Building takeover was a period of of um, you know escalating discussions between the black students and the administration and this this episode where um, the black students were given this copy of uh, a draft uh, program by by Jack Sell and didn't comment. Um, that was seen by the administration as uh, evidence that the, the black students really just didn't care. They just they just didn't care. They weren't serious. They weren't serious about their demands. This was just a rite of passage. But you know, part of what again, these are students, and uh, these are not professional educators, and these are uh, young people who have a lot of things to do. And so, the failure to comment on Jack Sell's proposal. And I think the reaction to it by the white administrators is more illuminating than it is uh, saying anything of any significance about the black students. Let me also say, there's no way that the individual could have been non-white. How many black students there were blacks? I, 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 I participated in the vigil, but I'm strong, right. Carol, I mean, so any way you look at it, it was going to be a, a white event. I think the, the thing is that there were a lot of things going on then. And um, it, I don't think there was like a formal action to say we did not support it, support the vigil. Right, um, right. But I mean, at the time it was not something that we said, okay, but we're there, but, we, but there were, again, right. there was help. There were black folks who were there recruiting um, for assistance for the strike. There were Black folks who were doing fundraising in their dorms and stuff. So I think to say that there wasn't support, there wasn't formal support, but that Black folks, there were Black people, Black students who did assist in the vigil. I, that's, I completely agree. And, and that's exactly what I found. But what I 
also found was that the support that black students had for the vigil was focused on the welfare of the workers and they weren't as involved in the vigil more generally as kind of a movement to change duke or uh, correct uh, but know, also remember new. that yeah. dr king at the time was working again with the equivalent of non-academic right. workers at duke and right. so that yep. just fit right in with what was going on at the time yep yep yeah, and the I mean, I guess it'd be a few years later, but the Charleston hotel worker strike or Andrew Young would show up at that, right? That it's, that, that that's also in there. Um, I mean, so I'm gonna ask you this question, but tell me if it's too simplistic a question. And that is, were white and black protests treated differently? Um, and then are the vigil and the Allen building takeover kind of remembered and commemorated? differently? Well, how differently the white students when they protested and the black students when they protested were treated and perceived is one of the real kind of themes in my book. Um, the vigil started with an occupation of the president's house for um, 36 hours. And so here were these predominantly white students occupying the president's house. But the president and Duke administrators were as solicitous of them as they could possibly be. Women uh, were concerned. They were sitting in the president's house, but they were concerned that uh, they were gonna violate the dorm rules by not signing out of their dorm. So the Duke president actually gave them permission to sign out of their dorms to the president's house. And in any event, administrators were in constant touch with the students and Really, together they navigated a, a non-confrontational end to that uh, occupation and the transfer to the vigil. In contrast to that, when black students occupied Allen Building, uh, you know the minutes of the meeting that uh, are re referenced in the book, it took the administration just one hour to decide that um, these students were trespassers and they'd be given an hour's notice. And if they didn't vacate, the police and National Guard would be would be put in play. There, there was never any of the deference that was shown to the white students. There was never any of the imagination that say, let's just kind of protect these students in the building and, and we'll just kind of resolve it peacefully. It was just a, a very quick decision and um, the students uh, in our Allen building were seen as militants and the white students on the quad were seen as family. And uh, I just think it's as stark as that. I'd like to just share that um, uh, some of our, our fellow classmates are of course in the audience. And uh, it's important for us to realize that it, it wasn't an either or, the focus was on, we need to take care of ourselves because the white people are focused on their points and we need to be focused on what our needs are. So thank you, Ted. And do you think that the two events, I mean, are they kind of fused together in one narration looking backwards? Do you think that they're commemorated differently or remembered differently or no? Well, Duke, the, the vigil has almost a reverential glow. I mean, that that is Duke's uh, favorite protest. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the ability now for Duke to connect with the vigil and how the students comported themselves and how it was resolved is, is it just really holds a special place in the heart of Duke. I mean, I think the administration has um, re-narrated uh, the, the Allen Building takeover, and they see it as an important step in the transformation of Duke from uh, a regional school to a national school and having racial problems and uh, not having racial problems. It, it definitely is seen and embraced as part of Duke's history, but it certainly is not held up as the kind of role model for um, how students ought to protest. That is for darn sure. And so this very idea that there are legitimate and illegitimate protests 
the sort of like parceling out. So in some ways they're patronizing, we're going to show you, like the patronize, the pat, what is the noun version of patronizing? Um, the being pa patronizing continues, right? On some level though. Um, so what is the point or the utility of talking about all of this, of remembering at this, of digging through these moments in the past? Um, why linger on the shortcomings of an institution? And I mean, I think I said this to y'all in earlier questions or a community or a nation that you are a part of um, and that for, you know, in many instances that you care about. Why? Why stir up the hornet's nest? Why not just remember the pleasant stuff? Well, I'd love to hear you all's view of this, obviously, but my opinion is that these patterns that you can see so clearly uh, in the 60s uh, repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat in, in certain forms at Duke and nationally. And, to the extent you can really see them and understand them and, and, and grasp them at work, maybe it provides the focus for a conversation that can maybe move the discussion forward. Would your response be different if we were having this conversation a year ago? I mean, I think the world, I think the US is a very different Actually, it's not the U.S. It's the climate is so very different in the past several months that does it cloud our thinking and our interpretation of race and racism? I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on many, many things, uh, including the question you've asked, but I... Uh, Sure, I mean, I think the current moment colors how the past is perceived, uh, but, but I think in the limited world of Duke, um, again, you, you, can, you can look at the types of initiatives and the types of programs that are being launched now as part of Duke's anti-racism program, and you can look back on the demands you all were making. And, you know, the demands have changed somewhat but uh, many of the same issues of inclusiveness and uh, uh, equity, you know, remain. And so whatever the national scene is, at least within Duke, and again, I defer to all of you who, I just think there are, at least I've observed and I was told there are patterns that, that continue to repeat. But no matter so, what those patterns are, we still need to understand our past and come to grips with our past. And uh, Ted, I applaud you for being as factual as possible, not that it was impossible, but that things that you found you were able to share in a way where you like, this is what it said. And I think that uh, honesty is an issue. We're not honest with ourselves. Um, and the people that have the power are not honest with themselves and uh, I, I, I have a lot of feelings about uh, being blamed, if you will. And uh, we're not trying to say, you're the ones that owned the slaves and, and mistreated us, but you're perpetuating what they laid out. And uh, it, it's a difficult pill to swallow. I do understand that, but uh, un until they get to what, where they're off track, they're not going to be able to see the other side. They're not going to be able to understand where we're coming from. And I say they, but let me throw me in there because I tell you, you haven't been raised in Alabama. Uh, I, I have some prejudices myself, not that I'm able to be powerful with them, but um, I do know that I have to step back, uh, Dr. Lynn Smith, and let the young people go forward because I get stuck in how I see things and um, may not move as easily as I would have back in 
uh, the 60s and 70s. So um, uh, thank y'all for letting me share that. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I think, as y'all say, ignorance does not serve us well. And maintaining comfort at the expense of knowing who you are is not going to not going to pay off in the long run. Um, but we have come to the end of our time. The chat is filled with people saying thank you. Thank you, Ted, for writing the book. Thank you, Janice and Bertie, for being here. Thank you even more for the work that you did as students and the work that you continued to do out in the world after you were students and for your unflagging generosity and commitment to the to the greater good. Um, thank all of y'all for coming. Um, hugs to all of y'all who have been part of this institution and have worked to make it better and yourselves better. And don't forget that at 8.30, um, I think that um, someone will put the link. Yes, the link just went into the chat for a post discussion discussion. Um, that builds on this conversation, but takes it other places as well. And that will be led by um, Deja Wood and affiliated um, groups. So thank all of you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Take care. Great. Absolutely. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for being here. Everybody go out and register 10 people to vote this weekend. Ding, ding. Thank you, Bertie.